Okay, so I'm Tammy theme with the Three Rivers Library System. Today we're going to talk about ethics in the library. And again, I hope everybody has cameras, microphones, <clears throat> or are willing to chat because I really want it to be an interactive presentation because ethics is kind of a gray area. Everybody's had different upbringing, different communities, different ideals. Um, so even though the same core ideas should be the same, there's probably a lot of ideas of how to handle things and we can all learn from one another. Okay, so what does ethics mean? There's a lot of words that pop out here. Um, honor, morals, conscience, uh, belief, and they all kind of tie in with ethics. So the term ethics is derived from the Greek word ethikos, which itself is derived from the Greek word ethos or ethos, meaning custom or character. And um, dictionary says it's ethics is defined as a moral philosophy or code of morals practiced by a person or a group of people. So you find that ethics actually varies from culture to culture, which makes it even more gray. So the American Library Association has a code of ethics, but they are also very, um, very broad, very vague. The principles of this code are expressed in broad statements to guide ethical decision-making. And these statements provide a framework. They cannot and do not dictate conduct to cover particular situations because everything is so different and can be handled just so differently. So we're gonna stop, start in with some, um, just some different scenarios. So there's a city council member, Dave, he visits the library and he wants you to look up some information. He's on his lunch break, so he's in a hurry and you are the only person there. However, you're in the middle of assisting Richard and Richard lives in a, an assisted living home for the mentally challenged. And a lot of times he'll come in and ask for copies because he's investigating different conspiracy theories. And you've tried to help him make copies, but he's not been able to figure out how to do the copier by himself. So what do you do? And this is where I really want some input. Um, so do you stop helping Richard and help Dave? I mean, he is a city council member and he's on his lunch break. Richard doesn't have anywhere to go. Or do you tell Dave, yeah, you're going to hold on. I'm already helping Richard here and I'll help you when he's just done because Richard deserves the same treatment as Dave. Or do you ask Richard uh, politely if he could wait and maybe give him a magazine or something to do so he doesn't get agitated while he's waiting for you? Or do you have any other ideas? So if if you want to use your microphone, great. Um, otherwise, you're well able to chat. What do you think? What would you do? Would you help Dave first or Richard first? And there's no right or wrong answer. That's why we're here. Holly said we almost always have someone on backup who we can call. In a lot of libraries, that is the case. In some libraries, there's only one person there ever. So it's always usually just me. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really, <laughs> um, we pride ourselves on treating everyone the same. Everyone is the same. Um, and so I think I would probably, you know, let that city council member know that it'll just be a minute. And I would finish helping the person that I'm with. But again, it's kind of case by case. And you know, if he's standing there tapping his toes and obnoxious, then then that may change too. Um, but I think with the city council members that I have, I think that they would completely understand and urge me to help that patron first. Does anybody else have thoughts? Because again, no right or wrong answer. I mean, ethically, yes, everybody's the same. And Richard was there first. However, if he's 
you know, people are people. If they're willing to, yeah, go ahead and help them. I think that's understandable depending on the case. I think I would help the, um, the guy that's on the lunch hour. And I would explain to the guy that wasn't that this guy is on his lunch hour. And if he didn't mind, I would like very much to help him because he's on a tight schedule. Yeah, politeness goes a long way towards everybody. Um, so what the ALA Code of Conduct says, we provide the highest level of service to all library users through appropriate and usefully organized resources, equitable service policies, equitable access, and accurate, unbiased, and courteous responses to all requests. And Holly says, if I know that Richard's going to take a lot longer and Dave would be much quicker, I might ask Richard to wait. Yeah, I think that's totally understandable. Okay, so the way I interpret this is that all librarian, library patrons deserve the same respect and treatment. A child deserves the same level of care as an adult. Homeless patrons deserve to be treated as well as the city council member. Each request should be given equal consideration. If you cannot offer service to someone for some reason, you need to find a way to accommodate that patron. For example, a language barrier. Uh, services, service should be offered without judgment or bias. Personal opinions do not belong in a professional environment. And the bottom line is that all people in the community are entitled to equal unbiased library service and all questions deserve equal treatment. So does, has anybody had any examples similar to that that they would share? Or has anybody demanded attention first? or <laughs> pretty rare when I have more than one person in here at a time. Okay, well, if not, we'll go on to the next scenario. Okay, so a new book has come out that is sparking lots of controversy. However, it's on several bestseller lists. A few patrons have asked when you're going to be getting it in the library. You heard that the book was challenged in the neighboring town. Personally, you do not agree with the content of the book based on the various reviews that you've read. What do you do? Do you not order the, do not order the book as you do not need the hassle of dealing with a challenge, especially on a book that you yourself would not ever read? Why bring about the drama when you don't have to? Or you tell the patrons that want the book to buy it for themselves and they can always pass it around if they so choose. And that will keep the library in the clear and the patrons will be happy and they will all get to read the book so everyone wins. Or do you order the book as it is what wanted by the patrons and you have policies in place to handle a potential challenge so you're prepared to deal with them if they arise and your personal opinions should not be reflected in the collection development or other suggestions. Holly says if it's in great demand by our customers should order it. Yeah, I would definitely order it. And the library should not be censoring information. Yep. I think we all face this with Fifty Shades of Grey. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny. I I remember that my predecessor, when I was at a public library, did tell a patron, "Well, if you want it, you can buy it and then donate it to the library." So I thought that was kind of interesting. That's kind of where I got that. You know, I actually do that. Um, Yellowstone is huge um, and it's a series on Paramount and it is, it's got a huge following. I love it um, and I don't normally buy R-rated movies for the library. I don't think that's where our money should be spent. I spend more on kids movies, but I bought it myself and I donated it to the library and it is the most checked out DVD in the library. <laughs> so, but I always do say when you check it out, you know, there are a lot of curse words in there. <laughs> but other than that, that's everyone that has brought it back has absolutely loved it. But I do, I, I do give that little disclaimer there, you know, it's a great movie. You just got to watch the, or it's a great series. You just have to watch the language. So, but yeah, I, I don't normally, I don't buy a lot of R-rated movies. And when it came out, I bought it for myself and absolutely loved it. And, you know, patrons were talking about it and I thought, you know what, that's gonna get people in the door. And it has because people that have never used the library have found out that we have it. 
and call and ask for it. So. And Liz says, get it anyway. Let the patrons who may be surprised know what's in store for them if need be. The more challenging, the more I want to get it. And Alyssa says, order the book. Yeah, I think self-censorship, it's, nobody wants to deal with drama. So sometimes it's easier to just back away, but is it the right thing to do? Pro probably not. If I, I had just, a lot of requests, I'd get it. I just buy the book myself and I loan it out to people who want it. You know, this is my book. You can take it home and read it. Just bring it back. But if I only had one person that wanted it, I would then suggest, well, maybe you ought to just buy it and you can donate it later. But if I had several people asking for it, I'd get it, even mm -hmm. if I didn't care for it. And I think it is key <laughs> in this um, to have policies in place because, you know, censorship of challenges, it's you want to be ready if something happens. And Holly says they're doing an interlibrary loan if only one wants it. Okay, so ALA says we uphold the principles of intellectual freedom and resist all efforts to censor library resources. And Alyssa says people are going to be curious about it. Right, when, when things are hot topic, everybody wants it, sometimes just for that reason. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so what does it mean? mean? I kind of interpret it that library patrons deserve access to all information. Information should not be limited to just what is deemed safe. Policies should be designed to protect intellectual freedom and prevent censorship. Library staff should make every effort to keep their personal biases out of their professions. And the collection should be well-rounded to be inclusive of all patrons. And the bottom line is collection development should be done to reflect the wants and needs of the community without personal or outside influence. Has anyone had any examples of this? I guess you've shared some, which is great. Anything else come to mind? Tammy, we've had a few in our library with like um, books on the transgender experience that some <laughs> people don't want us to have those. And so that's been kind of an interesting learning curve for us. <laughs> yeah, and I get that's again why you have the policies in place and you try to have a well-rounded collection, something for everyone in your community. And yeah, you're not gonna please everyone. We have lots of books that just have one person that checked them out. <laughs> Small communities, it tends to get like that. Yeah. So how long do you keep them on your shelf if that's the case? Until I don't know. I don't like to weed. <laughs> There's lots of old, old books on our shelves because I think, you know, that's part of that series. And that was really good. It's like um, Little Women. You throw that away or you save it. I saved it. Yeah, weeding's a challenge. I am Okay, on with the next one. Uh oh, do you remember Richard from the first scenario? It seems like he spent <laughs> he sent some of his conspiracy theory information to the wrong person, and now he's being investigated. So the police are in your library and they're asking questions. So you had through the past several months kind of inadvertently read some passages in various letters and documents and you thought they were a little scary and bizarre but you feared it was all harmless. I mean you're making copies and you happen to glance at stuff it's not like you intentionally were getting into his business but now what do you do you have the cops here. So you tell the police everything that you can remember including the dates and times that he was there and the passages that you read and your own opinions and and you know, it's the cops are doing their jobs. Or do you inform the police that they need to get the proper court documents in order to retrieve any information from the library? Patron privacy is an important aspect for the library. And besides, there are no records kept of the transaction being, you know, transactions they did. Do you check your scrap pile? Because you're certain some of the papers that Richard had copied didn't come out right. So you save them, use a scrap paper, because, you know, waste not, want not. 
Why she read perfectly good paper. It was only Richard's silly notions anyway. Or are there other suggestions? I claim old age. <laughs> I don't remember anything. <laughs> I point to my hair. It's white for a reason. Sorry. I wouldn't tell on him. Right. Unless unless he was building bombs or something like that. But conspiracy theories, uh uh, Liz says, bring me a warrant, buddy. And Holly says, B, we need a subpoena for customer information, and the subpoena has to be looked at by the city attorney. Alyssa says they need to get proper documentation. We need to protect patron privacy. Angela says, the library should have policies that cover this situation. The police need a warrant. Yep. Yep, that's what I feel, too. I mean, everybody deserves their privacy. And sorry, Holly, I missed that from the last one. She said about weeding, we have limited space and we will weed when they need, we need more space. Okay, so on number three of the ALA Code of Conduct, we protect each library user's right to privacy and confidentiality with respect to information sought or received and resources consulted, borrowed, acquired, or transmitted. So what does this mean? What happens in the library stays in the library. You do not share what someone is looking up with your friend or your spouse. You do not share a patron's records with anyone, not even a parent, a friend or a spouse. I guess I did it backwards. Policy should reflect the importance of confidenti confidentiality for patron records, which, like Angela said, policies. And any in-talk, in-library talk amongst staff about patrons should be done in private. And the bottom line is libraries must, must protect each other's right each user's right to privacy and confidentiality to the greatest extent they can. So Holly said, we can give general information such as, yes, we have seen this man in the library, but no information about him. And Elizabeth says, there shouldn't be any hard copies of documents because if they weren't returned to Richard, we would have shredded them by now. To see our cameras or glean any other information, the police would need a warrant subpoena and have to go through the appropriate channels. So has anyone had anything like this happen in their libraries or any other thoughts you want to share? Okay, we'll go on. Okay, so the library board is trying to come up with some uh, fundraising ideas for the library. One of them tells you about a great fundraiser that a group in the local school has done. They showed a movie outside drive-in style in a farmer's pasture. They collected money as goodwill donations and made a great profit. Profit. Inwardly, you see, as it is, of course, easy to make a profit when you do it underhandedly without paying the required fees to avoid copyright infringement. When you mention this as tactfully as possible, the board member waves your concern aside with the comment, who does that hurt? They didn't get caught and we won't either. It'll be fun. So what do you do? You refuse to take part in il any illegal fundraising plans. It's important to libraries for libraries to maintain integrity and a moral stance. Make sure the library board adheres to a higher standard of ethics as well. Do you go along with the fundraiser plans? After all, the school group got away with it, so why can't the library? Who cares, right? Or do you turn the school group in? Why should they get by with that when the library can't? They should have known better, and how dare they corrupt the students by conducting illegal activities? or any other suggestions i so, think i would try to figure out something else instead <laughs> so liz says anytime we get a new board member one of the few things is i say is that uh pay, pri sorry patrons privacy is absolute we will not share what they do or check out and that censorship is the big bad and we do our best not to limit our library and our patrons with the materials they can check out so that goes with the last one so for this one, Holly says, A, refuse to take part in any illegal fundraising plans. Angela says, share information about getting a public performance license. Great, share that information so everybody understands what the process is. Alyssa says, I would not go along with it. I would present research on other options and see if Nebraska Library Commission or a library system could help, help out. Angela says, facilitate the purchase of the license. And Liz says, we are a nonprofit organization. No way, I wouldn't throw anybody under the bus either. 
Right. I mean, I don't know that it's common knowledge that you can't just willy nilly have public presentations and make money off of it. I mean, we as librarians are aware of that, but in schools should have been too, of course. But. Uh, so ALA Code of Ethics says we respect intellectual property rights and advocate balance between the interests of information users and right holders. So what does this mean? Although libraries are intended to be a place to gather information, that information must be obtained in a legal and ethical manner. Policies and procedures should reflect the balance <clears throat> of the information users and the right holders. Librarians should maintain a constant awareness of copyright laws and requirements. Librarians should abide by those copyright laws and requirements at all times. And librarians often place notices of co copyright requirements on copiers, printers, and others, and such to advise patrons of copyright laws and diffuse liability from the library for misuse. The bottom line is librarians must respect and follow the balance that allows patrons to gain information without violating the laws that protect the rights holders. Um, so Liz says it definitely isn't common knowledge. Oh, there it is. The amount of people that are surprised that I can't just have movies playing all the time is insane. And Holly said, we have a performance license, but there are certain movies that we can't show due to copyright that aren't included in the license. Which here in Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission um, offers the Swank movie performance license, and, but that's inside the four walls of the library. Uh, so has anyone had any any examples or any um, anything they'd like to share about this? Alyssa says someone wanted to do that here with Husker Games. And Elizabeth said, any programs we have are free to the public to attend. And if we show a movie, we purchase the performance rights for that particular viewing. We also have policies for the use of our meeting room spaces for, by the public. They can't charge or earn money while using the rooms and the meeting must be open to everyone to attend. And I'm sure policies to go hand in hand with those things. Holly agrees with Elizabeth for there too. And Alyssa says same here. Okay, the next one. Uh, you finish up after a busy week at the library. You are happy to see that the latest bestseller that you have been dying to read on your weekend off is still on the shelf. You pick up the book and bring it to the circulation desk, and your coworker Bertha is working at the desk and says, you should wait and check this out when it's no longer so, as popular. Go put it back and pick out something else. What do you do? Do you put the back book back and make a different selection that Bertha's right, the patrons should come first and you can just wait to read it, even if you're disappointed? Or do you wait until Bertha's gone from the deck, desk and check out the book to yourself anyway? You should have a right. Um, why should you have to wait? Aren't your reading needs as important as everyone else's? And, or do you remind Bertha that employees are patrons too? You're off the clock, so we, you're not even currently an employee. Employees deserve equal respect, fairness, and good faith as patrons deserve, or any other suggestions? I actually have kind of an unwritten policy on this because I am the director. Um, I don't check out a new book until it's two months old. I just don't because I'm here all the time and those books are on hold for other people. Um, and I promote those books. And so my personal preference is to not check that book out until it's two months old, unless it's a Saturday afternoon and no one has it, then I may take it home and read it from Saturday to Sunday and have it back Monday morning. But normally, no, I don't, I don't because my patrons come first, we're very small, we have one copy. And again, I'm here all the time and it's not fair to the others that, um, that I would take the book first, especially since I'm, you know, promoting them. I'm you know, getting people in the door with this new book and then I have it at home. But being a bit, if it was a bigger library, that would be different. But since I'm kind of a one woman show, I just don't. Well, Holly said, well, I've never heard anyone here say that. 
Melissa says, what? How dare she? And Ollie said, I check it out to myself, either at my desk or at the self-check. Liz says, I wait until the new book is over a month old to check it out. Or like Angie said, if I know I can finish it by my next shift, I'll do that. Holly said, we don't have a policy about it, but staff may choose to wait on their own. And Elizabeth said, we aren't allowed to check items out to ourselves, but another staff member can check them out to us, or we can use the self-checkout machine. Staff can place holds on popular items, but aren't allowed to place themselves at the top of the list, as that's not fair to anyone. And so well, I'm a one and only. I just, I just wait till it's not going off the shelf so much, and then I'll check it out. I don't have a certain time frame. I know there are certain people. If it's on hold, then they get it first. Yeah, and Plattsmith, we have um, sort of an unwritten rule, but it was put into an email a while ago that says they should not, uh, staff should not use something in the first month. However, if a new movie's been here for three weeks and it's been sitting on the shelf for a week or so, yeah, go ahead and take it. It's, it's the waiting for the demand to die down. Holly said, I catalog movies, and so I see them first. I put myself at the bottom of the hold, hold list, though. Okay, well, ALA Code of Ethics says, we treat coworkers and other colleagues with respect, fairness, and good faith and advocate conditions of employment that safeguard the rights and welfare of our, all employees of our institutions. So what does it mean? Employees have the right to fair treatment. Employees should be treat, treated with respect. The library environment should have adequate conditions conducive to employment well, employee well-being. All efforts should be made to create a welcoming environment for staff as well as for patrons. Bottom line, library employees deserve respect, fairness, and good faith. So does that mean that staff should be able to check out books as everyone else? Um, I believe so. Yeah. I, I don't know what gray areas, but yes. A bit more of as a courtesy to the patrons. Yep. And Holly said, I've been told that we are also users of the library. Absolutely. A lot of times librarians are the biggest users of the libraries. So. Any other examples or thoughts on this one? on to the next one. Okay, so it is election time and Bertha is busy putting up a display to encourage voting. You can't help but notice that there are lots of books in the display for only one political party. You walk around the display to double check and you are collect, correct. There are no reference to any other party. You mention this to Bertha and she says, why would anyone want to read about any of those losers? These are the only books that really count. So what do you do? Since your political stance is the same as Bertha's, you let it go. After all, the majority of the patrons also agree. So why would, you, why would they wanna read any differing viewpoints? Or you remind Bertha that personal views cannot ethic, ethically be reflected in displays or collections. So you encourage her to add additional books to the display to promote an opportunity for patrons to gather information of all types. Or you immediately tell your supervisor manager, Bertha is always trying to push her own agenda around and it gets tiring or any other suggestions. <laughs> Bertha needs to get a new job. <laughs> That's funny. Um, I, buy, I buy the political books and the ones who know that my political views will ask me for mine, I'll bring them from home. Small communities no. are different, yes. I just had this, the last election I had, um, we don't buy a lot of political books, but I have one, I had one of each. Um, and I don't think anybody knows my political views. <laughs> Cause I just, it's a, it's a political free zone. It's so, <laughs> because they are very, you know, pro one thing. Um, and so yes, I am. Pro, well, and some are very pro the other thing. And yes, they are. I have, um, I have problems I have, buying. Yeah, I so. have very um, 
I don't know, maybe I'm wishy-washy. I just, um, I try to present both sides. Um, and so I kind of got some snarky remarks on, on that display, but I had to be fair and present both sides. So the only, the only political things that I have are like Michelle Obama's story or, mm -hmm. you know, some of, some of those have been requested and I don't buy any books anymore, hardly that aren't requested. I've bought some of those books because trying to be fair, both parties, everything, never go off the shelf. So I wasted my money. <laughs> Political books can that. be short-lived, yes. They have a short shelf life sometimes. Uh, Alyssa says, and I think this referred back to the last one, I also think it can help with readers' advisory, having librarians be avid readers and users of the library. On this one, uh, Angela said, the issue is that the other employee told her what to do. We don't have the right to tell someone else they can't check something out. Okay, that's also for the last one. Okay, Alyssa says, Bertha needs to get a new job. And Liz says, Bertha's <laughs> not a very nice librarian. Um, Holly says, um, no, we can, can't only promote one party. Elizabeth says, B, you remind Bertha that personal views cannot ethically be um, reflected. And Liz says B and C if it's been a repeated problem for sure. Angela said Bertha needs professional development on her role. This needs to be documented by the supervisor. And Elizabeth said she agrees with Liz. And Holly said, we even had red and blue balloons for our voter registration station. We were specifically told we can't have only one color or the other. Yeah, even if you accidentally just do one, it can be inadvertently slanted. And she says C and B. Yeah, if you talk, if you can talk to Bertha, great, but. I have a little, um, remember those T.Y. Beanie Babies? One of them is a, an elephant and one of them is a donkey and they're decorated with red, white, and blue. So I just put those out when I'm gonna do a political thing. And I, and I, I don't ever talk politics with anybody that doesn't already you know, uh, that we're not on the same page, so. And like I say, there's rarely more than one person in the library at a time. If there was a stranger in there, we would shut up. Yeah. Liz says, I don't buy nonfiction or political books unless they're specifically requested. Then I get the opposing opinion. Only once has political opinion come up in my near four years here. And that was an unstable patron who kept ripping political books off of the shelves and saying he wanted to buy them so he could burn them. He was asked to leave. <laughs> <laughs> and Holly says, we aren't allowed to talk politics at all. If a customer starts, I just smile and nod. Yeah. And Liz said it was a very weird day. It sounds like it. Yeah, it's hard to keep your professional or personal and professional views separate. Yeah, smiling and nodding, part of the job description. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see, ALA Code of Conduct says, we do not advance private interests at, our, at the expense of our library users, colleagues, or our employing uh, institutions. So what does this mean? The library's collection should be well-balanced, not simply a reflection of the librarian's personal likes or views. The librarian should re refrain from wearing political attire or pins while at work. While librarians are entitled to his or her own beliefs and ideals, they should not allow them to interfere with their profession. As a public servant, the library employee should always restrain from allowing personal things to conflict with professionalism. This includes business email being used as a personal agenda. So the bottom line, library employees should make every effort to maintain profession, professional neutrality. Uh, Jen says, how do you handle those situations when they dip into misinformation? Yeah, that's tough. You try to, you just, all you can do is have all the information available. Um, you can lead them to the information, but you can't, you can't force it upon them. Yeah. Need a horse to water, but can't make them drink. Yeah, that's a great question, Jen. I, unless someone else has some ideas.
And Elizabeth says, sometimes I'll say to patrons that I'm not comfortable talking about X subject. Is there anything library related I can help you with? And Liz says, I love Jen's question. Holly said, I recently took a webinar on in misinformation. Holly, do you mind sharing a little bit? Um, a couple highlights maybe? Yeah, good deflection, Elizabeth, writing that down. Yes. Try to steer the conversation back. Holly said, I change, will change the subject or redirect them. Yeah, I think it, misinformation is abound and it's and it's hard to know what to do about it. Any other examples or anything else on this topic? Okay, we'll go on to the next. And Alyssa says, just try to find a polite way to excuse yourself. Right. Okay, Bertha's at it again. She has decorated every square inch of the library for Christmas. She even has some Christmas music playing a bit too loudly over the speakers. You overhear a couple of patrons complaining that there is no place to avoid the Christmas season. They express disappointment that even the library, supposedly a neutral place, welcoming to everyone, has joined the bombardment club. You recently read an article and the author has made some valid points. So this was Epstein says, those of us who do not celebrate Christmas may be few and far between, but the irony is during this season of love, peace, and goodwill, many feel anything but those things. For that reason, I do not decorate the library for Christmas, Hanukkah, or Kwanzaa. I stick with neutral motifs of snow, snowmen, and New Year in order to support all patrons. I want my library to be a safe haven for everyone, and in this way, I try to lead, by to lead tolerance by not decorating the public, secular place, space of the library for Christmas. So what do you do? You share the article with Bertha and suggest that you tone the decorations and music down a bit to make everyone as comfortable entering the library. You spend all you're looking forward to Christmas, so you aren't going to let some crabby patron spoil the fun of the holiday season. If they don't like it, they can come back in January. <laughs> or you immediately tell your supervisor manager because Bertha is always trying to push her own agenda around and it gets tiring. Other suggestions? No, not Bertha. Yeah, that Bertha. <laughs> um, so what does everybody think about that one? I have Mickey and Minnie dressed as Santa Claus that ring bells like that and a lot of snowmen uh, it's just everything for that whole season the winter and I and lately I haven't even been doing those except for Mickey and Minnie which are older than the library I, I am Santa so <laughs> so I have to go with the full tree um so that I can host Santa. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, the rest of the decorations are snowmen and, and stuff like that. But, and the reason we do put the tree up is because we host Santa. Otherwise, I am a non decorating person. So <laughs> I'm finding that, that to be true with minutes. me too. Yeah. yeah. So we really do it up nice to, for Santa for photos mm -hmm. and then, and then I tone it way down. Doesn't it kind of depend upon your patron? Of course, if you know your patrons. I put up a tree and nobody seems to be bothered, but that's about it. Or I might decorate the windows a little bit, but I never play music in here. Yeah, know your patrons and your communities, of course. Well, and we actually sponsor the Tannenbaum Festival, which is the festival of Christmas trees. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah. Oh. Holly said, we put up general decorations that aren't overtly Christmas, like garland and gingerbread houses. We don't play music. Liz says, I do the neutral thing. Snowmen, winter stuff, and some trees, maybe a Santa or two. I try not to go too crazy with decorating. I say as I look around my Halloween-y little library. <laughs> and Holly said, we have snowmen. We do have Santa on a sleigh and two reindeer. We actually got rid of, or we got rid of our Christmas tree. Actually, I was the only one who wanted it, so I took it home. Liz said, my patrons like it when I make it look like I've dumped everything I have for the season out in the library. 
And Holly said, I do disp a display of Christmas movies and music and would include other holidays, but we don't have many, if any. And again, it probably reflects your communities, what you have available and how you decorate. I have some, some uh, middle age group people that come in and go, oh, I remember Mickey and Minnie from when I used to come here as a little kid. So that's, that's really, but I'm getting so lazy anymore, I don't really care. Digging all that stuff out, uh, not so much. I, we, for our tree, um, all of our ornaments are made by our kids mm -hmm. and they've been made by them over the last 10 years. So that makes it more special. Yeah, and the kids, the kids come and look for their ornaments. And, you know, I have a lot of little ones that make me um, salt dough or the cinnamon ornaments. And so those are what goes, those are what go on our tree. Very mm -hmm. nice. Uh, so ALA Code of Ethics said, we distinguish between our personal convictions and professional duties and do not allow our personal beliefs to interfere with fair representation of the aims of the institutions or the provision of access to their information resources. Uh, so what does this mean? Personal convictions should not influence the professional atmosphere of the library. Consideration should be given to ensure the library is welcoming to all. Respect of diversity and multi multiculturalism should help guide the tone of the library to serve all patrons equally. Personal convictions of the library staff should not be evident in the library's collection, atmosphere, displays, or other public areas. So the bottom line is the library should be a place of neutrality in order to serve everyone in a professional manner. I think, I think that really, you know, those, those things are for bigger cities. Here, we know everybody. It's all you know, it's what our people themselves want. Like I say, five people in here, that's a big, huge party. Um, so it's, it depends upon where you're at, really. Absolutely. Yeah, it's so different, no matter where you are, and just knowing your patrons, your communities, um, making sure that everyone feels welcome. If you get too, if you get too, too, too generic, they're not going to feel like it's their library. That's a good point too. Any other comments or examples on this one? Oh, Jen said, does everyone, does anyone ever have a situation where people think your personal political views or convictions are playing a part when developing the collection with diversity, equity and inclusion in mind? Isn't that funny? I my people all know that if if my views were in line, we wouldn't have anybody but Dean Koontz and, and Stephen King and uh, <laughs> you know the, the girl with the dragon tattoo. So they know it's not me. Yeah, isn't that isn't that funny? That's a good question too, Jen. But I, I actually talk to all of my patrons about the books that I select. Um, because you know, a lot of times when I'm choosing books, I have them in mind, or I have you know, mm -hmm. kind of that group in mind, um, and they have a lot of input. And so, I think I'm very transparent about it, and they know the time that I spend to choose them. Um, and so, even a couple that have been kind of duds, <laughs> you know, they have um, they have been fine with that. Um, and I actually just did the, the sweetness of water. Um, and that was a really good book. Um, I was, but it was a little different than maybe what I thought it was going to be. Um, but everyone really, I mean, I got good comments on it. So, hmm. Jen says, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. I work in an academic library, so I have some considerations to keep in mind that may not be applicable in many public libraries. 
Yeah, I mean, the goal is to have information out there to everybody, but if you're in a small library with a small budget, I think you really keep in mind, you hate to buy a dud that you know no one's gonna read. Um, so it is, it's a hard balance uh, collection development in small libraries. I try to find new authors because some of my people are just stuck. They just want Patterson or they just want, you know, I try to get something that's similar to it that they can have a selection. Explore their horizons. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and Alyssa says, I think having a variety of topics and viewpoints is key. You never know what someone may want to want to or need to read. That's true. Some people may not ask. And if you don't have it, they may walk away unsatisfied and you'll never know. But gosh, it's it's a hard balance. Liz says, thankfully, my parents, are, my patrons are pretty open minded. We have standing authors where we have a list of authors that we will always try to get their new books, except James Patterson. A few years is good enough for me. And then I try to get an assortment of different books in each age range. I get asked a lot, do you have murder mysteries like Patterson, but not as gory? And thankfully, I've got some lady author murder mysteries series to suggest. Other, other comments? And yeah, it's good to have backup lists of ideas. Reader advisory is, is fun if you have things to offer. Okay, the next one. You have been busy reading articles, watching webinars, attending conferences, going to workshops, and all sorts of continuing education opportunities. You find them enjoyable, and you are always excited to try, to try the new things that you learn. That Bertha, she rolls her eyes at you and passive aggressively makes snide comments about you not doing your job because you're gallivanting around instead of working. <laughs> Bertha, yeah, Liz, you're funny. So what do you do? You just ignore Bertha. She, if she doesn't want to learn new things, that's her problem, not yours. You realize that patrons rely on librarians to keep up new things. So you encourage Bertha to embrace the continuing education opportunities you tactfully remind her of number eight code of ethics, remembering that it is your responsibility responsibility to encourage your coworkers. Or you immediately tell your supervisor manager, Bertha is always trying to push her own agenda around and it gets tiring. So Liz says she would report her after trying to encourage. Holly says, A, you just ignore Bertha. She doesn't want to learn new things. That's her problem, not yours. Liz says, but goodness, why is she a librarian at this point? Alyssa said, I would encourage her as best as I could, but she sounds like a tough one to deal with. Um, any other thoughts or any thoughts? <laughs> Put mice in her coat closet. <laughs> Don't get on Lisa's bad side. So number, I'm old, I can do that. <laughs> number eight, ALA Code of Ethics says, we strive for excellence in the profession by maintaining and enhancing our own knowledge and skills, by encouraging the professional development of coworkers, and by fostering the aspirations of potential members of the profession. So what's this mean? Uh, librarians need to continuously maintain and build their skills in order to do their jobs adequately. Librarians need to always identify areas in which they could benefit from extra training. Librarians should make the effort to encourage the professional development of coworkers. Librarians should welcome and inspire those who may express an interest in librarianship. And constant learning is being a part of a librarian. Bottom line, in order to remain relevant, librarians need to keep up with library and technology trends and innovations. So any thoughts, comments on this? Liz says, I just got told my, by my boss today to never pay for librarian education opportunities out of pocket ever again. The library has a budget for me to further my education to be better at my job. So happy to hear that. That's awesome, Liz. Liz, that's She's the way it lucky. Is. Do you not have a budget for it at all? It is very little. So basically, they pay me my time. And they will pay for, like, if it's a 15 or $30 
thing for a class, they will pay that. But when you start talking some of these conferences where it's a hundred dollars or more, there's no way. There's no budget for it. I'll put a plug in here though that remember in Nebraska Library Commission does have a scholarship budget and Trails also offers some scholarships for um, continuing education things. But if I don't work, I don't get paid. <laughs> What's the deadline on getting my paragraph to you, Holly? I mean, Tammy. Um, it, sometime within the next couple of months would be great. <gasps> but as soon as you, we get that, we'll get the money to you because Lisa got a scholarship and went to NLA. So first time, yay! It was and Alyssa cool. said, yay, Liz. And Jen said, love that. And Elizabeth said, what a great boss. Holly said, I have worked with someone like Bertha, a lot of ignoring her because it was constant and supervisors knew about it. And Alyssa said, that's what scholarships are for. And Holly said, we have a budget for staff ed too. That's awesome. Any other comments, thoughts? The next one, a family has recently moved to town and the matriarch of the family is from Kenya. She wants to meet some of the community members. She offers to provide a presentation at the library complete with some Kenyan food to sample. You need to determine whether the library should host such a program. What do you do? You jump on board with this idea. It's a great opportunity to build awareness of diverse cultures, learn from one another and hey, there's food. Or do you decline the offer as you do not want her noticeably different culture to be even more obvious by giving her a platform? Or you decide that this is such a great idea that you expand on it. You invite others to share their various heritages and you welcome even more food. This may even become a regular event in which to celebrate our diverse cultures or other suggestions. Alyssa says also free events such as this are great. Liz says yes. And yes to Alyssa and yes to all of this, A, no C. <laughs> Holly said A, but if you're, but you have to be careful about the food because of how it's prepared, et cetera. You have to have a food handler's license here too. Oh, that's a good point, Holly. A food handler's license, that's interesting. Hmm, I thought it was a really good idea. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I never thought about the food handler's license, but yes, that's good to know. Again, not maybe, maybe not common knowledge. Liz said we had a foreign exchange student from Vietnam here last year, and she held little presentations on our projector, educating us about Vietnam, very educational, very cool. I opened it up as we did her presentations, but no bites because besides her, someday. And Alyssa says I vote C. I would go with C. So in Plasmouth, we actually had a staff person who um, was born and raised in South Africa. Um, and we had, she was a little reluctant to do a full presentation. So we knew that the um, a local priest was um, from Kenya. So we had a day where we did um, Kenya and South Africa and they each did about half an hour and it was really well attended. Oh, that sounds awesome. I wonder if you couldn't have uh, the lady uh, bring recipes and, and little how to's on that food and have her, you know, tell people eat it only if you want to try it and if you're not allergic to anything of it. Right. Hmm. Yeah, but what do what do uh, churches do when they have like a bake sale or you know schools used to do bake sales? There was nothing about a food license at that point, right? Not lots of churches, no. Yeah, and churches have you know their food mm -hmm. events where they sell it to the public. So doesn't that fall within the same category, or even chili cook-offs or? I think sometimes it falls in that category if you're selling it. And Holly you don't said, have to have it licensed. Holly said, I'm pretty sure our library has a food handler. <laughs> well, so I thought about even um, an author comes visits and you put out um, desserts or if you have 
snack or food license. Sorry. Yeah, you put out snacks for stuff like that. Um, is, would that be considered different? I, yeah, it's interesting. May have to look into that to make sure that we are all doing it correctly. We always have, we have uh, yes, pizza, pizza ranch pizzas. Yeah. Okay, Holly said she's in Texas. So maybe that's different. Oh, I'll have to look yeah. here in, you brought up some good points. So I'll have to check that out. That's Texas could have some different food down there. And uh, Code of Ethics says, we affirm the inherent dignity and rights of every person. We work to recognize and dismantle systematic and individual biases to confront inequity and oppression, to enhance diversity and inclusion, and to advance racial and social justice in our libraries, communities, profession, and associations through awareness, advocacy, education, collaboration, services, and allocation of resources and spaces. This one was a new one, um, I believe just this year added to the Code of Ethics. So what does this mean? This was just adopted on June 29th of 2021. Everyone is equally welcome in the library. Efforts are made to provide collection materials and services for diverse communities, promote racial and social justice. The bottom line, all walks of life are welcome in the library. Efforts are always made to keep awareness and information available for everyone and equal treatment of all patrons. Well, what do you do? What do you do if, if in fact you have um, diverse populations, but they don't come in the library? Should I still buy books for them and they don't ever come in? Yeah, it's a hard sell. I mean, for example, teens, it's teens don't want to come in the library, but if you don't have books for them, they're never going to come in. But right. if they don't come in, do you still buy the books? You know, I think you do need to try to have limited budgets. Again, it's a hard balance. I bought five of the graphic novels. Yay. <laughs> five awesome. of them. Those ones. Are they going out? Um, Actually, my two boys took them all out and they brought them all back now and, and they haven't said buy more word. so i'm sorry i inter interrupted you lisa what did you say there i said they they took them out they've read them they brought them back and they didn't say oh gee lisa buy us some more of these they didn't say that so I'm but not if they read them maybe you made a difference so liz says yes lisa so it's there when they do come in which I agree. I mean, budgets, when you have a small budget, it's hard to get for, but they will never come in if you aren't able to serve them. We have, we have the, like the babysitters club and those in the, in the comic book format type mm -hmm. hardcover books. We have some of those, but those Japanese ones that we had on that workshop. The manga. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I got five of those, and now I got some from somebody who was giving them away or something. So, but they they like to play the computer. That's what they want to do. Right. Um, Elizabeth said, then we need to figure out how to get them in so that they can see that you have something for them. Holly said, our graphic novels are hugely popular, especially with teens. And Jen said, also gearing an event towards those potential patrons may help bring them in. Once they start coming in, they'll likely uh, find more reasons to visit the library. That's a great point. Elizabeth says, I'm at, at an academic library, so I started visiting ESL classes held on campus to let them know about our ESL collection. What a great, a great place to start. Outreach, you have to go to them sometimes, I think. And Yo, Holly Tammy! Said, <laughs> Am I Daddy, locked come up? Back, come back. I can hear you. You can't hear me. Uh oh. Hello. Can you not hear me? Hmm. 